So I would like to touch three main points. And then afterwards, I will present to you the unique, unique network. It's actually unique in the sense of the first network of post-industrial cities in Europe that aims at uh, integrating students and also researchers from eight uh, very interesting European universities. I will come back to this after, my, uh, after presenting the slides. So the first is why post-industrial cities? This is very much related to this unique network of post-industrial cities. But uh, what is the very interesting point uh, in uh, looking at post-industrial cities? Then I will uh, make a, a brief uh, reference to the term great transformation. Anybody of you knows uh, where the term great transformation comes, uh, comes from? Just let me look the chat. Anybody knows? Nobody raises fingers. So the term great transformation actually was the title of a very influential book of Karl Polanyi. I will come to this uh, in a minute after the first point. I will uh, argue and um, try to reason why I choose the term great transformation. This is old stuff, but very, very important for our current uh, situation and our discussion in this course. And finally, I will present some social institutions that structure, from my point of view, post-industrial cities. And uh, let's begin with the first point. What is a post-industrial city? I mean, I think all of you put this, raised uh, this question and I will give a brief definition that I found in the Oxford reference uh, website and which from my point of view is quite uh, extensive and critical um, at the same time. So here we find as a definition, a city, a post-industrial city is a city exhibiting, exhibiting the characteristics of a post-industrial society. So the next question could be, what is a post-industrial society? I mean, it's, it's a bad definition uh, to uh, define uh, one term by another term that is not defined. But let's uh, see how it works. The next point is, service industries dominate with a strongly developed quaternary sector and footloose industry, industries abound often on pleasant open space at the edge of the city. All of you have in mind, for instance, the headquarters of Google or Amazon in the United States in uh, California. And then you see this kind of uh, nice buildings and uh, people working uh, in very nice green uh, areas, not in the very center uh, of the city, etc. Second, Post-industrial cities are also characterized by large areas of office blocks and buildings for local governmental or government uh, uh, administration. Third, these cities often exhibit marked, marked inequality of income distribution because of the contrast between those who are appropriately skilled professionals, managers, administrators, and those in high technology service industries, and the poorly paid service workers who look after their needs together with unemployed. You only have to uh, check here in Bochum and you will find all these characteristics in Bochum as a post-industrial city. You will find the university campus outside the city. You will find the former Opel, uh, uh, Opel territory, where now we will, uh, th they are raising uh, up a, a very advanced uh, new technology based companies. Uh, you pass by uh, taking U35 uh, every day. So we know some of these elements, and we also know 
the poor uh, people distributing um, packages, Amazon, your uh, orders or uh, food uh, that you ordered uh, in the um, uh, restaurant, uh, bad, badly bad paid and uh, unemployed people and poorly paid service workers. This is just the mix that we quite well know uh, from our own experiences. So this is a critical reflection on what's going on in so-called post-industrial cities based on specific branches and sectors, professional groups that uh, dominate uh, or are dominant in the economy of these cities, but also the social inequality uh, that exists in these kind of uh, cities. Next point, the former, uh, the, the well-paid can afford high house prices and in fact contribute to them, the latter cannot. All of us, we know these problems of, for instance, families with one or two children looking for a house or a homing, uh, home um, apartment, it's, it's quite expensive. Uh, um, if you go or try to go to the preferred, preferred areas, etc. Phelps and Ozawa, last point, present a taxonomy of forms of agglomeration in post -industri proto industrial, industrial, and post industrial urban contexts, commenting that contemporary post industrial agglomerations are larger than preceding forms with an increasingly complex pattern of specialization within and between urban areas. And those of you who are interested in geography, and we have some specialists uh, studying geography, you can observe this same uh, point here in Bochum, for instance, the city is extending. For instance, if you uh, go for the U35, uh, in terms of areas, the, the, the city is extending, but at the same time, the population of the city of Bochum was decreasing. Some 20, 30 years ago, Bochum counted more than 400,000 people. Now it is about 380,000 or 70,000. So decreasing population, but increasing use of territory and um, post-industrial agglomerations um, as, um, with complex patterns of specialization. So I think this is a first idea of what a post-industrial city is all about. Now, I would like now to present some elements or aspects that are crucial for analyzing and understanding the dynamics of post-industrial cities aspects that we will um, touch during this course and that are uh, aspects that are um, mainly focused on social sciences but also on culture literature political science economic uh, economy uh, etc so crucial aspects of post industrial cities first refer to the history and their trajectory from industrial to post industrial in all its aspects Think about Bochum, think about Liège, uh, Bilbao and uh, the other cities I will present in a minute, uh, um, uh, integrating the network of Unique. All these cities had a very high uh, degree of heavy industry, of carbon dioxide uh, intensive industries, and then changed uh, to either um, uh, being uh, a city in crisis, in full crisis, or uh, uh, in a transition to uh, actually uh, service-oriented and uh, increasing wealthy post-industrial dynamics. This we will see in the next session is historically very, um, uh, we have a high variance of this difference, different histories of uh, post-industrial cities. The second aspect is the economic structure, for instance, like the sectors and the employment in post-industrial cities. Is it service industry like Amazon or is it service industry like um, data protection um, agencies uh, like the out, um, 
the, the companies, the young, the young startups uh, coming out of uh, the University of Bochum, for instance. A third point, what about the population development and the population de uh, composition in terms of age groups, of educational levels, etc.? Is education going down or raising up, or is it a tendency towards polarization? This is what the definition that we heard uh, just before um, is arguing that we probably go into a polarization of educational levels in post-industrial cities, that not everything is nice and uh, uh, wealthy, but uh, that uh, in post-industrial cities also are quite challenging um, uh, developments. This leads to the fourth point, social inequality. What about income groups? What about gender roles and gender division uh, or gendered division of labor? What about ethnic groups? Are these post-industrial cities uh, ethnically uh, diverse? What about citizenship rights? Have all people the same rights or is it uh, a, a dualism between um, foreigners uh, with very, very low level of citizenship rights and the privileged um, uh, denizens. The fifth point, migration history and current situation. What about out migration and immigration in these post-industrial cities? Think of Cork, one of our unique network cities. Cork was um, a city of emigration during almost 200 years. And since some decades, one or two decades, uh, Cork is uh, turning into a city of immigration. What does this mean for a post-industrial city? Bochum, for instance, the rural region always has been um, a city of immigration and now is ongoing uh, to be a, a center or a region receiving people from many, many countries. Next point, political regimes and governance, public administration and planning. What about these aspects of post-industrial cities, how are cities administered? Do uh, um, uh, political parties, uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, social movements, etc., uh, are they in play, in play or don't, um, are they more or less marginalized? This goes uh, on with the next point, culture of living together, public discourse, creative groups but also the diversity and lines of belonging by ethnic language migration groups, etc. So is it uh, like um, Steve Werterweg coined it, is it actually a super diverse city or is it only a city of uh, marginalized groups that are excluded from the very hard core of uh, services and uh, economic growth and uh, welfare in the city. Finally, social movements, migrants organizations, civil society participation, non-governmental organizations are crucial and also the, the, the relation between geographic and social spaces of work, of care, of leisure and socializing. Where do you actually meet your friends? In the Bermuda Triangle? or in the campus of the, of the city, in the banana curve uh, in, in, in Bochum, or do you go travel to other cities? So what actually is the social space of work? What is the social space of leisure, of socializing? And finally, super diversity. I mentioned this term coined by Steve Werterweg. Super diversity as a characteristic of uh, modern post-industrial cities with all its aspects of social inequality, urban planning, and uh, probably, if possible, social innovation. Okay, so these are some aspects. And when we will speak about the program in, in 10 minutes or so, you will see that much of all these topics pop up in the different uh, sessions that we are uh, proposing and organizing, we have a very nice um, set of highly experienced lecturers 
who will introduce each, uh, lesson, each uh, session by a 20 minutes, 30 minute input uh, lecture. And then we have opportunity to speak with them. And we will cover almost all of these uh, aspects that I sketched out here on this uh, slide. Okay, so this is post-industrial city. Uh, so what do we need if we speak about post-industrial cities? We need, and you as a group are the best example of this, we need interdisciplinary cooperation because no scientific discipline as an um, isolated uh, endeavor ever will understand the dynamics of post-industrial cities. And this is why uh, I put some of the disciplines uh, that are crucial for understanding the dynamics of post-industrial cities. It's historians, economists, it's demographers, sociologists, political sciences, it's cultural literature studies, it's geographers, it's lawyers and public administration, and perhaps it's anthropologists and ethnographers. Much of these different disciplines will be integrated in our uh, course as lecturers and as texts to study and read. Okay. Just to give one example, I don't know if you can uh, read it. Uh, it's, it's a little bit uh, difficult, but it's only one message. In order to understand the difference between what we call an industrial city and a post-industrial city. And I circled, I marked with a red circle, the city of Duisburg and the city of Bochum. And here we find as the bars, the uh, carbon dioxide emission in the rural region in general. And this is for 2020, the percentage uh, of uh, the overall and the percentage of industry, traffic and uh, heating in the overall composition of carbon dioxide emission. And you see very clearly, this is 38 percent uh, of the overall uh, emissions in the rural region come from Duisburg. And this is because smoking? No, it's because of the heavy metal of the steel industry. Yeah. Duisburg is one of the European centers of the very centers, worldwide centers of steel production. And perhaps you know that there are many efforts to turn the carbon dioxide com consuming steel production into a green steel production using, um, uh, uh, using different uh, gases uh, in spite of uh, carbon, carbon uh, of coal. And here you see Bochum, it's less than 2%. The cities are almost similar in, in, in population, 400 to 500 thousand people, but the share of carbon dioxide emissions varies substantially between Duisburg Essen and almost all other cities. Here in Kreis Unna, in Gelsenkirchen, in Kreis Wesel, this is where we have chemical or steel industry. Yeah? So this is, gives us an idea of what industrial cities are, and Bochum was the same. Bochum was uh, the same uh, intensive in carbon dioxide emissions uh, 30, 40 years ago. Okay. So this is the first point. What is a post-industrial cities? I think we have an idea that it's a very complex uh, uh, meta uh, post-industrial city is not just uh, only economic aspects. It's not only cultural aspects, but it's just the interdisciplinary view on what is going on in these uh, new uh, conglomerations. Now, why great transformation? The second point or the second part of the topic of our uh, course, why we call it great transformation. This is because what we experienced in the so-called post-industrial cities during the last, let's say, 30 to 40 years 
is not just a smoothly uh, shift from one industry to another, but it's a huge and radical, an almost revolutionary uh, shift from one logic of functioning of a city to another, a new logic of functioning in a very short period of time. And the, the, the scientist who coined this term, uh, great transformation, is Karl Polanyi, I told you, and he uh, published a book in, I put it here on the, on the ground, uh, in 1944, a book called The Great Transformation, The Political and Economic Origins of Our Time. I warmly invite you to study um, or to read this book. Uh, we can upload it. I think it's not, uh, until now, it's not uh, uploaded, but we can upload it uh, in the, for the session of today. Because it will, it is a classic, and you know, you see forward by Joseph Stieglitz. Jo Joseph Stieglitz is one of the most recognized economists of, of the world. You know that he's uh, um, he, for instance, financed the Open uh, University in uh, Budapest uh, that had to had to be transferred to Vienna because uh, Orban was not very happy with the teaching activities of this university. So Polanyi is a, a very, very important um, uh, scientist. He uh, died in 1964 in, in Canada, in Ontario, uh, and lived first in Hungary, then in Vienna, uh, the United States, and then in uh, Canada, because the United States received him well as um, uh, uh, scientist, but his wife, who was a socialist, was not accepted in, in the United States. So this is why they lived and he died in Canada. So I have some uh, citations of the text of this text of uh, Karl Polanyi, and this is mainly dealing with a great transformation from the, let's say, feudal agrarian uh, conditions during, uh, let's say, the 16th to, 90, uh, to, to 18th uh, century in the United Kingdom to the great transformation towards industrialization and industrial capitalism. So uh, Polanyi addresses the process of industrialization in the United Kingdom. And this is not the same, but it's, we, we deal with a post-industrial uh, uh, transition. Uh, Polanyi dealt with the industrial transition or the transition to industrial cities. And he takes as an example the process of the so called enclosure of open fields uh, that were used as commons. In German, we speak of Kommende. You, know, you perhaps know this uh, 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 um, term. Uh, commons as, uh, um, as fields used uh, by many people of the community in a shared way. Uh, so enclosure means that these commonly used uh, uh, agrarian sites were enclosed by fences uh, so that and were privatized. And they they changed from arable land to pasture. So um, it was much more profitable for the landowners and for the new landlords upcoming with capitalism. It was much more profitable to uh, turn uh, arable land to pasture uh, for sheep runs in order to have the wool for the textile industry that began to grow up in uh, the United Kingdom since the 18th century, almost 100 years before the industrial, heavy industrialization began in Germany. So from 1490, from the 1490s to the 1640s, the king's lords and the peasants themselves resisted to this process of 
enclosuring uh, their common land, commonly used land. Uh, this process was mainly driven by wealthy country gentlemen and merchants, so by the new capitalists that, that became the most important new bourgeoisie uh, after or with the uh, increasing capitalist uh, economy. What Karl Polanyi argues is that in the name of the so-called free market logic, as uh, an, almost considered as natural economic law, uh, private liberal interests were put over justice and the commons, the common interests of uh, the people um, in general. Um, this was the process uh, that then led to the industrialization, to the heavy industrialization process in England uh, since the 18th uh, century at the latest, and in Germany mainly during the 19th century, the industrialization. Um, so Karl Polanyi argues that the capitalism turned into a virtuous uh, circle since the, with the industrialization of the 18th, 19th century, uh, but the foregoing process since the 15th century was very complicated and the mark, free market logic was retained and framed, um, was uh, slowed down by kings, lords, and by the peasants themselves, by social movements of the peasants themselves. Because it was until the 18th century that the new textile industry was able, actually was able to offer new workplaces. Um, and therefore, the argument is that what turned into a virtuous circle since then resulted as disastrous in other contexts of other countries. For instance, this great transformation from using uh, arable uh, countryside land for uh, sheep holding to produce wool in order to fuel the textile industry and then the, um, the, the, the industrial capitalism, what worked quite well since the 18th century in UK was disastrous, for instance, in Spain, because Spain copied the English system, the UK system of turning arable land in uh, pasture, and uh, thus this uh, led to uh, eroded soil and if you now uh, go by in, in Spain, pass by to the Andalusia in the south of Spain, you will see uh, almost devastated land. So this is the main argument um, that Polanyi puts in his book, uh, Great Transformation. I'm not able to, to uh, refer to everything, uh, but the, the, the interesting point is that we can learn from my point of view, we can learn a lot of this view, let's say, analysis of the great transformation that led to the industrial societies and industrial cities. And now I have some brief um, uh, text citations of this work of uh, uh, Karl Polanyi. Mm, and he argues, he argues against the logic, what we, in nowadays would call the neoliberal logic of the market rules. Let the market make and everything will be fine. This is uh, the, the, the mantra uh, that was uh, dominant in the UK during his time and uh, to some extent uh, until today. And a belief, as he, as he calls, a belief in spontaneous progress must make us blind to the role of government in economic life. This also holds for the analysis of post-industrial cities. Believing that just the market logic, the free competition of different actors, uh, um, 
uh, uh, companies will resolve all uh, problems uh, could be very misleading and erroneous. This role, he goes on, this role consists often in altering the rate of change, the role of government in economic life. Uh, altering the rate of change, speeding it up or slowing it, do slowing it down, as the case may be. In the case of England, during two centuries, uh, the government slowed down the process of enclosures because the, the peasants uh, marginalized from their land by this process of enclosure didn't find any employment. They, they, they were not able to find jobs. And he say, goes on, if we believe that rate or, uh, to be unalterable, or even worse, if we deem it a sacrilege to interfere with it, what the neoliberals uh, say, then of course no room is left for intervention. Enclosures offer an example. In retrospect, nothing could be clearer than the Western European trend of economic progress, which aimed at eliminating an artificially maintained uniformity of agricultural technique, intermixed strips, and the primitive institution of the common. The common coined here as primitive institution. And um, this is uh, the critique of uh, Polanyi, that this is just um, uh, the, 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 the mantra of the free market competition as being able to, to resolve all the uh, related problems. As to England, he says, it is certain that the development of the woolen industry was an asset to the country afterwards since the 18th uh, century, leading as it did to the establishment of the cotton industry, that vehicle of the industrial revolution. And in the next se uh, session, when Stefan Berger will hold his lecture and you will read the text of the, the introduction of a very interesting book uh, dealing with the post-industrial cities, you will see that, for instance, for Manchester, this is uh, almost referring to the city uh, of Manchester. It, it's exactly what happened in Manchester. I was there uh, last year, and, and you can go to this museum that uh, Stefan Berger mentions in his text. It, so it was exactly um, the vehicle of the Industrial Revolution, the uh, cotton industry in the UK, what in Germany, for instance, was the steel and coal industry. Furthermore, uh, he says, it is clear that the increase of domestic weaving depended upon the increase of a home supply of wool. You know this process uh, of man manufacturing industries at home, homework, in the sense we know uh, uh, the corona forces us to work at home, uh, uh, 200 years ago, homework was part of the wool industry, spinning uh, machines in the households, etc., etc. This is what he refers to. Um, Polanyi goes on. Uh, they would prejudge the issue by assuming that the event took place under a market system. However, natural it may appear to us to make that assumption it is unjustified so it's not simply a, a, a natural logic even the logic of bochum passing from an industrial to a post-industrial city is not just a natural uh, a neutral a process when nobody uh, loses and nobody uh, gains but it's um, it's a very complex uh, social process this is what uh, um, Polanyi is arguing. Such a system is an institutional structure which, as we all too easily forget, has been present at no time except our own, and even then it was only partially present. Institutional structuring of our life. Yet apart from this assumption, long-run considerations are meaningless if the immediate effect of a change 
is delittering deliterous, then until proof to the contrary, the final effect is deliterous. And now he says, if conversion of arable land to pasture involves the destruction of a definite number of houses, the scrapping of a definite amount of employment and the diminution of the supplies of locally available food provisions, then these effects must be regarded as final until evidence to the contrary is produced. So he argues that we have to uh, analyze uh, the pros and cons, the different aspects, positive and negative uh, social science effects of uh, this kind of industrial change. Now, uh, finishing, England withstood without grave damage the calamity of the enclosures only because the Tudors and the early Stuarts used the power of the crown to slow down the process of economic improvement until it became socially bearable. Employing the power of the central government to relieve the victims of the transformation and attempting to canalize the process of change so as to make it cause less uh, to make its cause less devastating. Well, it's heavy, heavy uh, uh, meal at uh, at uh, this afternoon. But I think you at least at least you caught the basic idea why I used or proposed the term great transformation. It deals with complex social change that has many economic, political, uh, psychological, etc. aspects, and that is embedded in institutional structures of different social institutions, not only the market, not only the state, but also further uh, institutions that uh, structure these uh, processes. And I will come to this uh, now as the last slide for today of this uh, input. The social institutions that Karl Polanyi is referring to and that we should take into account when dealing with the emergence of post-industrial uh, cities are uh, at least five from my point of view. It's not only state, it's not only market, but it's also network. And this is my five, my proposal. It's five basic social institutions that structure the economy, but also our life in general. Five social institutions with specific resources that are negotiated in this or by this institution in different social spheres that are related to spe very specific action norms that differ one from another. And uh, I also will give an example of all of these. The first one is what we could call the network of family. The, uh, as I told you, spinning uh, was first based not in companies, not in in, in capitalist fabrics, factories, but at home. So economic life for hundreds and thousands of years was organized in the family network of direct social relations that were based, as I put it here, on the principle of unspecific reciprocity. Unspecific reciprocity of solidarity and trust. In a family, you trust each other normally without ha having to sign a, a, a contract every day. So it's this social network logic based on unspecific reciprocity. If, you, if I uh, raise up uh, three children, I have three children, I never ever made a contract with them, uh, obliging them uh, to uh, care, take care of me when I'm older, but there are some implicit, uh, perhaps some implicit expectations of reciprocity 
uh, even with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you will not uh, make this kind of explicit reciprocity deals, but it's implicit uh, and unspecific reci reciprocity that are based on and structuring um, uh, our social primary networks. A second social institution, and this was very important in England as well, is a second basic uh, social institution that structures our life uh, is a profession or professionalized work. Here we speak in, this, in, this, in the terms of Pierre Bourdieu, uh, an important social sociologist, we speak of cultural capital as the main resource that we can mobilize uh, as compared to the social capital in the first uh, place. And here the rule is not reciprocity, but um, um, following specific professional ethics uh, in science, for instance, ethics of truth, looking and searching for truth, uh, etc. No? Um, and um, examples are uh, occupations and training system, like in Germany, the dual uh, vocational training system that is very important and very unique in Germany. Well, the, the third in, uh, institution, social institution, uh, that is obviously one very crucial institution in modern capitalist societies is the market logic. Economic capital, money, uh, shares, um, um, ec um, shares are important. And the action norm is optimizing individual benefits based on specific reciprocity. It's not unspecific reciprocity, but it's specific reciprocity. You go uh, to Aldi, buy a bottle of wine, you, get, you pay uh, th three euros or six euros or 10 euros, according to your money and efforts and your taste. And you get uh, the bottle and, and leave the money. This is a very specific kind of reciprocity relations in the market logic. And uh, the market as a social institution mentioned by uh, Karl Polanyi. So we have a job market, uh, salary crisis uh, relation. So if we have an economic crisis, this has an impact on the salaries, et cetera, et cetera. But we also have fourth, the logic of organizations. The logic as a social institution. Organizations as modern profit companies, factories came up, popped up, since the 18th and mainly 19th century in Euro all over Europe as because we need the free market logic, we need uh, the, the freeing of uh, peasants of the Leibeigenschaft of being owner of the feudal, feudals, etc. We need uh, 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 the right of uh, Vertragsrecht, we need the right to, uh, to deal with uh, uh, contracts all this is a precondition for uh, raising up and searching uh, of um, uh, organizations in the modern uh, uh, system of uh, profit and non-profit organizations. This was not existent before the 18th century. Nothing of this ex existed before. In an organization, your resources are mainly based on your positional capital. Are you uh, the owner? Are you head of department? Have you a specific knowledge in the company or in the organization? Even for Greenpeace, if you are the IT specialist in Greenpeace, you will have a specific positional capital and knowledge, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's mainly organization specific rules that uh, organize uh, this uh, sphere of social relations. Uh, and if you, uh, for instance, one of the most famous um, researchers on organizations, uh, Charles Perrow, um, published a book called The Society of Organizations. All of us, we live in organizations all the day, all the day. What we are doing right now is based on the specific, uh, specific, specific service of group as, you, as a university organization, 
of Zoom as a profit organization that uh, rents the services and of many other uh, organizations. And the final is the state or the public regime with the political capital as the main resource and the action norms of laws, legitimacy and collective goods or commons as mentioned before. Here we speak of labor laws, of health and security laws and uh, provisions, etc. cetera. Uh, we see, WC is not water closet here, but it's works councils as a specific form of interest representation that we have in Germany, okay? So this is just to give an idea. Uh, this is my focus, this is my um, uh, concept of social institutions that structure modern life in post-industrial cities. And this is extending a little bit what Karl Polanyi mentioned in the citations I presented to you as the different kinds of public regime, the lords, uh, et, et cetera, intervening and slowing down economic processes where they stopped the logic of market uh, in order to control the social change. And what we will learn all during all this course is that all of these uh, different social institutions are relevant for understanding the dynamics in post-industrial cities.